So something that people often ask us at Meet the Midwives is what is it like to get prenatal care with a midwife? So I can answer that for you um, also in terms of what it's like to get care with a physician. So the difference between a physician and a midwife is that midwives are experts in normal. So normal, typical, uncomplicated or very minimally complicated um, pregnancies, uh, labors and births. And so we don't have to spend our time talking about people's serious diseases or their surgeries or you know their triplets in their uterus like a physician might because physicians are trained in surgery and high acuity situations and more complicated things. So instead of having to deal with multiple medication management, we can talk about how are things going at home? How are you and your partner preparing for this baby? Have you thought about how what you want your birth to look like? Have you thought about who you want at your birth? So the biggest difference I think is that time that we can spend getting to know you and addressing more than just your health concerns because your health concerns are gonna be pretty minimal probably because you're young and healthy and it's probably gonna be fine. And we can talk about other things and give you some anticipatory guidance about what to expect as your body changes um, and as you get closer to delivery and having a newborn in your home. And the other thing with midwifery care is that we are very um, in dialogue with you the entire time. So it's not like we're gonna say, okay, you should do this, this, and this with your pregnancy or this, this, and that with your testing. We're gonna share with you the risks, the benefits, the alternatives of everything we offer everything that is standard of care, and then let you make the decision that works best for your family. And we're not gonna treat you any differently if you don't choose what we would recommend. So a good example is the flu vaccine. We recommend the flu vaccine. There's a lot of good data that it helps pregnant women, it helps newborns. But ultimately, it's your choice. And if you decide you don't want the flu vaccine, it makes no difference to me. If you decide you do want it, it makes no difference to me. I just want you to stay healthy and safe, but I also want you to do things that feel right to you and to your partner and just for your family in general. So that's the midwifery approach. Um, it's very not, uh, it's very patient directed. It's not so much, not as much provider directed. And we offer the same tests as an OB would offer. So we offer the same ultrasound, the same genetic testing. Those things are standard of care in the United States and they're not set by individual clinicians. They're set by national, you know, uh, physician organizations and midwifery professional organizations. Those things are all offered to everyone. The difference is we're going to take time to explain them all to you, and we're going to let you make the decision that works for you such that at the end of this whole process, you're going to be able to say, I had this testing, this is what it tested for, and I did it because I wanted to get for this reason, or my labor went this way, and the reason it went this way is blah, 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 up, and this is why it had to go this way, and this is the decision we made, so that everything is totally clear about every single decision. A question that comes up often is the IUI program. Sometimes people want to know, do we do IUIs? What are IUIs? So IUI stands for intrauterine insemination. We do inseminations out of our Arlington office. We call it a social program. We're not infertility specialists, although we do know how to dive a little bit into infertility. Many people who come to our program are same-sex couples looking for a little assistance getting pregnant, single moms by choice. Sometimes people are referred to us by other fertility centers and they've already had a full infertility workup and they need to get six IUIs or six inseminations before they can start doing IVF. Many of the infertility centers send people to us to do the inseminations with us because it often costs less money than it does with an infertility center. So we are happy to see women. We do basic infertility workups. We do blood work. We can refer for more complicated things. I work over at the Arlington office and really enjoy seeing insemination patients there. So one of the questions that we often get is, um, are you going to be there um, as my primary midwife that I see in the office um, for my labor and birth? And the answer is, we, we hope that we could be. It's always wonderful for us um, when we're able to be with a woman that we've been working with in the office. But um, we do work as um, a team and our midwifery team takes call shifts that are usually 12 to 24 hours, either 12 or 24 hours long. 
and um, you might be giving birth with any one of the wonderful midwives. The group of midwives meets weekly for um, a three hour stretch to discuss patients and our approach to patient care to be up to date on all of the, the newest information around um, midwifery and um, obstetrics and how to care for a woman. So we're all very much on the same page as far as how we approach um, labor and birth. And um, I always do tell people that you're gonna find, and I, I do believe this, that you end up getting the midwife that you need um, for where you're at in, in birth. And I, I found that to be true for myself. When I gave birth here with the midwifery um, group, I didn't, you know, didn't say that I wanted a specific midwife and just kind of left it open. And for both of my births, I had two different midwives um, with very different kind of personalities, but they ended up working out perfectly for what I needed in those moments. So the midwifery group is very strong here. Um, you may see the midwife that you see in the office while you're on labor and delivery. You may not, but I think you will have a wonderful experience with whatever midwife you end up being with. Hi everyone, one frequently asked question is where to go when you arrive in labor. So during the day, the, all of the hospital doors are open and you should park where it's most convenient for you and come in. You take the south elevators up to the fifth floor following the signs for the Bain Birthing Center and you'll check in at labor and delivery. If you come in at night between 9 p.m. and 5 a.m., then the only door to the hospital that's open is the emergency room. So you should park near the emergency room and enter through those doors and someone will help you find your way to the south elevator and again up to the fifth floor. So one question that sometimes people have is what happens if labor and delivery is too busy when I go into labor? Um, and the short answer to that is we make do. Um, you know, there are some practices or some specialties where you can, you know, say, you know, like orthopedics comes to mind where you can schedule out your surgeries, you know exactly how long they take and you can have them all systematically scheduled so that week by week everything's perfect and you're never overburdened and you're never under, under uh, staffed or under um, busy. Um, and unfortunately on labor and delivery, we don't have that option. We can try to have you guys all come in exactly on your due date and, and pick and choose who we have for clients based on that, but it doesn't work out that way. And so there'll be some days when people will come in and we'll only have one other person there and other days when, you know, it feels like the bus full of pregnant women all showed up together in labor. Um, and um, our staff is just very, very good at sort of figuring out how to manage that when that happens. Um, occasionally, it will happen that all of the labor rooms are full and somebody will come in and act a labor need in a, uh, a labor room. And then we will try to maybe take somebody who's being induced, who's not yet in labor and moving them into a non-labor room space um, so that we can sort of shuffle things around. Oftentimes when that next person comes in, things might still be early and we can kind of have them walking around for a little while while we're cleaning another room and turning it over. Um, but the bottom line is that we have a lot of extra little clever spaces that we can use um, when things are very busy and um, we seem to be fairly full. Um, there is a very rare situation, maybe once every two years when um, the acuity is such that we really can't accommodate one more person and we have made arrangements to transfer people to other area hospitals. Um, when they're midwifery patients, we always try to transfer to a hospital as midwives so that we can gain level of services that you might expect at Mount Auburn offered to you. You know, sometimes the reverse happens where other neighborhood hospitals are busy and they might send people our way, but it's a very, very rare situation where we can't accommodate things because things are too busy. So. Not to worry, we will take care of you. Um, a question that we often get asked in Meet the Midwives is sort of things like, what are the things that midwives do to support normal birth? And what should I expect in labor as far as care when it comes to midwifery care? Um, and I always like to preface this 
speech by saying that like, I am very biased as a midwife, but I think it's important to remember that midwives are experts in normal and that unless something has come up that has proven you to either be not a normal healthy person or not having a normal healthy pregnancy, um, that pregnancy, labor, and birth are normal physiologic processes. And so usually you're best served by somebody who really also believes that it's a normal process, who um, is aware of the ways that things typically go and also the normal deviations from normal and sort of how to be as supportive as possible for you in this journey of a, a normal physiologic process. That's just like why I became a midwife and why I do what I do. Um, um, in terms of care on labor and delivery from midwives, we tend to be much more involved, give a lot more hands-on support, be in the room a lot more. Um, we are always responsible for taking care of multiple things when we're on call. So another wonderful thing about having a baby here at Mount Auburn Hospital is you're going to have a nursing team that is going to be completely dedicated one-to-one -one nursing with you when you're in labor. They are also very supportive of normal physiologic birth. They're used to working with midwives and having women who um, want to be well supported in labor. And so even when we're not available to be in there with you, you'll have a great nursing team. And then when you're in the active phase of labor and definitely during pushing, we try not to leave the room. Um, and there's always at least two midwives on call so that even when we are one-to-one -one with somebody, there's somebody else who's out and available to handle things that come up. Some people ask us if you can have an epidural with a midwife, and the answer is, of course you can. Uh, in fact, we have a 51% epidural rate in our practice. Um, that is a lot lower than the national average, which is about 72%. Um, and I think the reason we have a lower epidural rate than the national average is probably multifactorial. We do provide a lot of labor support. We are happy to do water birth. Um, hydrotherapy if you don't want to deliver in the water um, or can't deliver in the water but you just want to be in the tub um, that can help you get over the hump um, also we have other medications um, including nitrous oxide which is laughing gas um, that you use a mask for um, kind of like at the dentist office and so using those other techniques and non-pharmacologic uh, pain relief techniques like um, positioning, back rubs, and just moral support. A lot of women get through without an epidural. Um, and some people plan to have an epidural like from the get-go. That's just their birth preference and um, that's completely fine. And an epidural is the most effective pain relief method that we have. It's the most kind of heavy duty. Um, if you get an epidural, um, then, then the epidural stays in place. Um, in a small catheter in between the vertebrae in the epidural space in the back. And it stays in place until you're done having your baby, the placenta's out, if there's any stitches that are needed, um, it provides pain relief for that. Um, and then we turn it off. It's, a, it's on a pump and we turn it off after everything's done. Um, then it wears off in about an hour or two and then you can usually wiggle your toes and your legs and um, get up and walk to the bathroom for the first time, usually um, about an hour after we turn it off. Um, so it's, it's an option for you. Um, a question always comes up that, um, you know, do we allow doulas? What is a doula here at Mount Auburn? And also, um, you know, are we supportive or do even um, patients and their families really need doulas in labor? Um, and I would have to say that we are very supportive of doulas. Um, we see them as an integral part of the birthing team. Birthing doulas or postpartum doulas are professionals that you hire personally. They help you um, oftentimes in prenatal preparation, even from childbirth education to taking care of your, you know, physical, psychological needs in labor and birth, helping your partner do that. They will help with nursing, um, lactation, some postpartum home doula care afterwards. Um, so this is something you would have to contract with someone. We can 
you know, direct you to some professional organizations that can provide you with lifts, um, doulas in the area. And, you know, it's totally up to you. It's not essential that you have a doula by any means, but both the midwives and the doctors um, work well with them. We enjoy their services very much. So you can ask your provider in the office about professional resources that they can seek out to find who that might be. A question we often hear is about what we do regarding inductions. So uh, a common reason why we induce people is if you go a week or so past your due date. So we know that the due date's an approximation and we like to give a little wiggle room on either side. But if you go more than a week past your due date, that's when we start thinking about possibly inducing the labor because we know the placenta can sometimes stop functioning as well if you go a while past your due date. We usually induced somewhere between one week and two weeks past your due date. Uh, and where you fall in that depends a little just on your preferences. Many people by one week past their due date are really ready to be done. Other people say, I absolutely don't want to be induced uh, if I don't have to be. And also um, what your cervix is doing, if your cervix is starting to dilate or what we call ripen. Another reason we might induce is if there's any medical complications. So some of the big ones would be gestational diabetes or gestational hypertension. Um, and the other reason we sometimes induce is for um, patients who are over 40. They recommend inducing around your due date. So we kind of move from one to two weeks past your due date to two around your due date to a week past your due date. Um, oftentimes we also do an ultrasound called a biophysical profile about a week past your due date. Um, and that's to look at the amniotic fluid and the general fetal well-being to kind of feel comfortable to go a little bit farther. We generally induce in a very slow and, and patient way. So we know that it can take some time to sort of convince your body that now is time to have the baby. So we usually do something called cervical ripening, which lets your body get ready. So we have a couple different ways of cervical ripening. Um, so that means that sometimes you might spend one, two, or three days in the hospital getting your body ready to induce. We also have some options of kind of starting that process and letting you go home for a little bit and then come back. So that depends a little bit again on sort of how your body has already started preparing and generally that's a little more common with a first baby versus a second, third, or beyond baby. Um, and then when your body is more ready, sometimes that cervical ripening puts you into labor on your own, and sometimes we need to use Pitocin. I think sometimes Pitocin gets a little bit of a bad rap in the greater world, but I will say at, at Mount Auburn, our motto is start low and go slow. So we have very slow and gentle Pitocin um, protocol. We also have the wireless fetal monitoring. So even though you do need to be on continuous fetal monitoring, if you are on Pitocin, you can still walk around, you can still get in the shower, you can still get in the tub, you can still birth in various positions. So I think that makes a really big difference. So having your body be nice and ready through a lot of cervical ripening, having that wireless monitoring and a slow process for doing the Pitocin, I think really helps try to mimic your natural labor as much as possible. So at least at Mount Auburn, having an induction does not mean you have to have an epidural. I've seen many, many, many patients deliver um, and birth labor with an induction without pain medication. Some people may opt for pain medication in that case, and then that's totally fine, but it's not necessary. Um, so, you know, we're really here to support you on your birth journey, and if that birth journey involves an induction, we're going to have a lot of conversations about it. So also just remember that these are recommendations. We're going to be looking at how you're doing, how the fetus is doing, what are your goals, and making a plan together that feels safe and, um, and acceptable to everybody. Thanks. I'm going to answer for you the question of what um, happens um, should you need a C-section or to expedite your delivery. Um, how do we collaborate with our physician colleagues? So 
I'm happy to say that rarely is um, the need to uh, for a cesarean or for a vacuum delivery really emergent. So we have wonderful working um, relationships with our colleagues um, and we generally know and have been talking to each of them about your progress along the way. Um, and if there is an event that we think you might need a C-section or a vacuum delivery, we invite our physician colleague in to introduce themselves, talk about um, you know, recommendations, um, and give you some time to answer questions. And um, from there, we work with a collaborative team with the nursing, anesthesia, pediatrics, physicians, to make the transition to the OR or to um, having the delivery in your room um, as seamless as possible. In the OR, we, the midwives stay with you um, throughout the delivery if possible, and sometimes we do assist in a cesarean section. But in general, we like to do skin to skin with you and your baby. It is our goal to try and keep the baby with you and um, your partner throughout the cesarean section and um, recovery process. I hope that answers some questions. The question that I am answering tonight is, how early can I have my baby at Mount Auburn? And the answer right now is 34 weeks. So if you come to the hospital and you are in labor at 32 weeks, we would transfer you to a facility that is safer for you and your baby to be born. Um, because what we need as a hospital is a facility that can take care of a 32 weeker. And we don't have that right now. Um, so what we would do if you are 34 weeks in one day and your water breaks and it's time to have the baby, your baby's decided it's time, um, you could stay here. So um, sometimes patients come in and we think they're in labor and they get transferred to a different hospital and the contractions go away, the cervix doesn't dilate anymore, and so there's a possibility that you could end up delivering at Mount Auburn. Um, but anything under 34 weeks at this point is transferred to another hospital. And if you're over 34 weeks, then you can stay here um, and we will take care of you in the NICU, uh, which is the nursery for babies that need a little more help. And so that could be for various reasons, obviously for you, and your baby it would be because your baby was born a little bit on the earlier side and sometimes they have respiratory issues so they don't breathe as well um blood sugar so we need to monitor their blood sugars um and they just maybe weren't quite ready to leave um inside and so they need some help kind of making that transition and so there'll be a full team that will be helping out with that transition for your kiddo all right and anything um less than 37 weeks is considered preterm. So 34 to 37 can be here at Mount Auburn. If you're 37 weeks and above, then that's considered full term, just so you know that if, if that wasn't totally clear to you. So that's, that's the answer to my question. We look forward to taking care, taking care of you in labor. At Mount Auburn Hospital, we have uh, a, two, a level 2A nursery, which means we can take care of babies at 34 week, weeks of gestation or older. Uh, we are currently also building a level 2B nursery, which will allow us to take care of babies at 32 weeks gestation and above. If your baby requires um, extra support that a level 3 or 4 nursery would provide, we can easily get that transport set up and send your baby um, to a nursery that can care for them. Uh, we do encourage rooming in for every family, and that is to get used to the rhythms of your baby, um, get a lot of good skin to skin in, work on breastfeeding, you'll have lactation support each day. Uh, if your baby needs to be in the level 2A nursery that is staffed by neonatologists, then we can get, um, the parents can come and visit the baby at any hour of the day. There is no restriction on that and we still do encourage nursing if that's possible. Uh, if your baby needs to stay beyond your stay, so if you are discharged and your baby needs extra support for a longer period of time and you are exclusively breastfeeding, we do try to accommodate mom and um, have her stay and board in a room 
where you are discharged from our care, but uh, able to be with your baby. So we often get asked about um, breastfeeding support um, at the hospital and you know what sort of resources are available. Um, of course, as midwives, we support breastfeeding um, and really support you know whatever you decide to do. Um, so of resources, we do have lactation consultants who are available and see um, all of our first time moms and then other moms who are experienced breastfeeders who may need a little extra support. Um, in the hospital as well. All the nurses and midwives, you know, are trained in breastfeeding support. So, um, you know, we are available to help as needed and even encourage um, right after birth is a really great time to start breastfeeding um, if that's what your plan is. And we can help you as a midwife do that um, and your labor and delivery nurse. And if someone needs a C-section, we, um, as often as possible, try to do skin to skin in the operating room, um, which basically um, the midwife or a nurse, um, you know, is able to be you and the baby and sometimes even get the baby to latch in the OR. So, so there are all sorts of resources available. We also, you know, talk about it a lot um, during prenatal visits and there are classes available to do prenatally. And, and then, um, you know, we have lactation consultants that we can refer people to um, after the baby's born as well, if, if someone is having issues. Hi, I'm Ariella Borkin. The question that I'm going to be answering is, what if I'd like a doctor and midwife? Can that happen? And so one of the things we feel really strongly is that there are a lot of benefits to the primary model of care with the midwife, which means that a midwife is providing your prenatal care, attending your birth, and then uh, also meeting you and providing care for the postpartum period. And we try to facilitate having one or a few midwives that you get to know throughout your pregnancy so that you have that continuity and relationship with them. And we ask that if people decide midwife model or the physician model, but the sooner the better. And um, if you choose a physician model, then you'll be attended at your birth by a doctor. And if you choose the midwife, then by a midwife. And we work very closely with our physician colleagues and may consult depending on um, medical need, but otherwise feel like it's a very important relationship to maintain and um, are very happy to be able to provide that care throughout the pregnancy and beyond. People do have a lot of questions and I'm going to answer one of them today. The question is, what happens after I go home in regards to visits? Normally, there are the two weeks appointment and the six weeks appointment. For the two weeks appointment, it is more like checking in we want to make sure that you and your family are doing fine, that the baby is nursing well, and most importantly, that you're feeling happy. For the six weeks checkup, we want to make sure that everything is back to normal. But of course, you can always check in by calling. We are just one phone call away, and we are here for you 24-7. Hi there, I'm Leslie. I'm one of the midwives with Mount Auburn. I've been a midwife for almost 20 years. I usually work on labor and delivery and in triage. I also help organize and facilitate the postpartum support group, which I'm very happy to say we are now offering virtually. I absolutely love the postpartum support group because I get to spend time with you and your babies and help guide you through a truly awesome time in life that can also be very challenging. The group is a great resource. It's an opportunity to connect with other parents, share questions and concerns. We also have, almost always have a guest speaker and our guest speakers have expertise in a wide array of topics relevant to the postpartum experience. Guest speakers include lactation consultants, pelvic floor physical therapists, sleep consultants, infant development specialists, um, mom and baby yoga instructor, the list goes on. Anyway, we would love to have you. Take care. Hope to see you soon.